Jane, Rhiannon, really good to see you both, two young you. Scottish planners of the year. Um, it's a really exciting time to be talking about planning in Scotland, and I don't think planning has ever been more important or more necessary in achieving some of our really big public policy goals around tackling climate change, the nature crisis, and ensuring that we reorient our economy towards well-being. Um, one of the big challenges, of course, we feel is we have we face, of course, is we have the vision for what planning can do, but we want to encourage more people to come into the planning profession. So I'm really keen to hear what inspired you to go into planning. What was it that made you think, I want to be a planner? How old were you? And what was your experience like from having that idea of wanting to do planning to actually becoming a planner? So maybe if we kick off with Jane and then we'll take Rhiannon. Um, well, to be honest, I kind of fell into planning. I did go back to university in my late twenties um, to try and find a career. I took a course in environmental management, which was largely quite broad in terms of the skills and the sort of employment sectors that I could work in. Um, happen chance, one of the subjects there within was planning, and it was something that I really enjoyed. I've previously lived in Dundee and Liverpool, um, and seen a lot of regeneration kind of after I've left and. You know the real life experience and, and learning how things actually come to pass on the ground was a, a, a real tangible interesting subject for me and what do you think are the the key things that can attract people into planning what do you think are the opportunities that planning provides for people as a career um well i think really it's something that's all around you you know and it's something that certain times in your life you might be affected by a housing development nearby or you know any kind of development uh, whether it's near your work or where you live so i think the fact that it is there and it is pretty much in front of you um mm. it's hard to escape and i think that the key link is understanding the processes and procedures of how things actually come to pass and that certainly was an interesting point for me for you, Rhiannon, was it a, a light bulb moment when you decided that planning is a career I want to pursue? Yeah, there was actually. It was it was when I was in sixth year at school. My sister, she worked for a property consultancy and she sat next to the planning team. Um, at the time, I loved geography. It was my favourite subject. And she was the one who actually suggested, I think you'll quite like planning. It suits your personality. It brings up your interest for geography. And from that, it was it was a way to make a career out of what, what at the time was one of my biggest passions. And um, 15 years later, I reluctantly have to say my sister was right. Um, and it is, it's, it's a really, it's been great for me. And it's something, it's, it's a way to put something I've really enjoyed into practice and, and to help others and to create great places. You said, if I remember correctly, but something that was identified by your sister as suiting your personality. Um, what kind of personality and temperament do you think you need to be an effective planner? I think a planner has a, a lot of unique attributes, but I think one of the, the kind of biggest things is mediation and patience and problem solving. I think it all falls into that kind of wider skill set. It's a lot of soft skills that you develop as a planner and it's trying to find solutions to problems a lot of the time. And um, I think you notice it in both sides, whether you're working in private sector or consultancy or even in any of the other sectors, to be honest, everyone's got competing interests and you need to try and find a balanced view and a balanced judgment that benefits the, the greater good, essentially. So um, I think it's that that's always appealed to me, that there's always a, a real positive focus and it's very solution orientated and it's it's trying it's trying to make the, a better place, isn't it? That's, that's the end ambition for us as planners and there's quite a... The thing that appeals to me is that there's quite often quite a clear legislative framework to work within and there's there's rules and ways to processes to follow but on the opposite side there's also opportunities for a lot of creativity as well so um yeah now that's really interesting you say that particularly um around creativity because it's one of the things that has really um, excites me about planning is it's not just the the day to day development management and the important skills of your know, mediation and balancing competing interests, but I've been able to go and take a vision of an idea and actually fully develop that into something. And there's nothing I think can be more exciting and inspiring than to embark upon that journey. Is there any particular 
projects or in pieces of work that you've been involved in in your career so far that has really inspired you and made you just given you so much energy and motivation and drive and just really reminded you why you got into planning in the first place i don't know if you want to have a stab at answering that jane um there's been quite a few like different little projects nothing of any major scale uh thus far although i'm getting more into major work uh as a planning consultant um and i think sometimes in planning some projects can take quite a long time. Uh, I think Dundee Waterfront is a perfect example of a 20 year process before things really start coming on the ground. And whilst that was nothing that I worked upon, it was something we definitely covered a lot in academia. Um, and it's just interesting to see um, how that's been brought forward, how long it's taken and all the work behind it. And, and now seeing it coming on the ground is, is it's definitely uh, quite inspirational what, what you're trying to achieve. And what about you, Rianne? Is there any particular projects that you've been involved in that if you were asked to go into a classroom and give a talk to people in sixth year and inspire them to take up planning as a career, that you would cite as a great example of the power of planning? Do you know what? It was something I did really early on in my career when I was um, working at Tape Plan and then later in Greth and Cross Council, the development planning team. And we went into schools and we used Minecraft. And it was trying to teach the students that this is how you use, this is this is essentially planning, we're planning places, and to try and further that understanding of the links between what they maybe know and can relate to and what planning is. And it just it, it was one of those things that really clicked. I mean, as a, as a child, I played The Sims. This is maybe a different generational thing, but it is it's building places and towns. And I think it's trying to show that there's a link to that and there is a job within that as well. And it's it's kind of the next steps of putting that into practice and how can you make your place better, building on what you maybe learned through games or or what, other your, what else your lived experiences might be. OK, well, I have to ask. I played The Sims when I was younger as well, and I loved that game. How did, Let's be honest, how much of a perfectionist were you in building your houses? <laughs> Pretty much, of, well, I'm, I'm, a, I'm quite a perfectionist anyway, I have to say. Um, I like things done a certain way in a certain order, so um, like you can imagine my house would be pretty <laughs> pristine. <laughs> <laughs> it's interesting to hear. I've been also talking about the things that have inspired you into planning and the things that you have been inspired by in your career so far that you would you know, cite as examples to other people. I just wonder if you get any sort of comments on what you think some of the perhaps biggest misconceptions around planning as a career are. Is there anything that you hear regularly, Jane, that you think that's not what planning's like at all, but it's perhaps a view that is quite prevalent, but ultimately misinformed? Um, I think I think there's the, the concept of it being like overly bureaucratic. I mean, obviously we do have to work within a legislative framework. There's um, certain regulations, etc. there. There's application forms to be filled in. But ultimately what you're trying to achieve is on the other end of that. Um, and these are official things that you need to do. So I think that is a, a bit of a misconception. Perhaps maybe some people think that it's like a dry kind of thing to do. Uh, and I couldn't really, really disagree with them, uh, but again, it's about that bigger picture and really kind of buying into that. And if you have that bigger picture and that kind of passion, then you can get beyond the odd wee dry kind of task and, and really get in behind the work that needs to be done. And that's what's interesting is the conversations, the projects and, and really driving things forward. It's, in, it's really interesting. Um, I remember there was a meme that used to go about and it was um, it was four photographs and it would say something like what my friends think I do, what my mum and dad think I do, um, what my partner thinks I do, what I actually do. If, if you were going to go and design a meme like that, Rhiannon, and how would you sort of um, how would you design such a meme like that to go and say what the reality of planning is versus perhaps some of the perceptions around it? Yeah, I think it's that's that's a really interesting question, actually, because um, I think it's funny when you speak to people who don't really know much about planning. So I remember my brother saying to me, for example, oh, that's what you do. You're that person that told that old lady that she needs to take her fence down because they only ever hear about the enforcement cases in the news. They don't hear about the good news stories. So you've got that kind of 
quite a negative public perception sometimes of what planning is from people that don't know what they're doing. And then you maybe hear from other professionals that it's all red tape and rules and regulations and you need to do this, this and that. And then I think you've got what you actually do, which is to find solutions to problems, to help deliver national in initiatives, like the kind of wider green recovery, that's all linked into planning. How we respond to the biodiversity crisis, that's planning. How we create safe places, that's planning. I think it's so, it's, it's in everything that we do that people don't understand the significance, well, maybe not understand, that's not the right word, but they don't see the significance and the tiny changes that planning makes to make the place a better place. And again, they just see the, the bad news stories in the press or the case officer or the consultant who's complaining because you filled in a form wrong and they don't actually see the solutions that you make because too often as planners, we're not often brave enough or bold enough to say, well, if it wasn't for me, this wouldn't have happened this way. And and it is all that kind of getting good solutions and outcomes for places. Do you think there's something perhaps around the time scales in which planning operates that makes it more difficult and challenging to create and develop a wider public appreciation, indeed perhaps a, a wider appreciation and understanding amongst policymakers? Yeah, I think particularly for the public, I can imagine why it would be so difficult when, um, if you imagine there's a housing site next to you and it first comes through in the local plan process and it comes through, obviously this is now changing, but it came through in the MIR and you first hear about it and then there's no proposals for it, there's no idea of where the houses will be located and it's really hard for someone to understand that and to, to to get to the basics of it and then it's then it's in the plan so you know there's going to be housing there but you don't know what it's going to look like and then the developer comes a few years down the line and they put their plan in and they, they still don't know what it's going to look like and that all comes before an application is even in and there's any certainty on what it could look like and then does it get approved doesn't it get approved how long is it in the system for does it get called in does it go to appeal it can be years down the line from when they first hear of that. So it must be really difficult without understanding the background of all the process that goes into it and why there's a need for all that process to try and keep on top of everything sometimes I think could be quite challenging. Yeah. Is that something you agree with, Jane? Oh yeah, most definitely. Um it is like it, like I said about the Dundee waterfront reflecting on that, the time time scales for some of the things can be quite long. The process may be little understood. And like you say, uh, Rhiannon, like planning permission in principle doesn't necessarily give that tangible idea of what that development is going to look like. So again, it's down to proximity to things and being able to actually understand it. It's low, where something's a long term thing or seems quite um, vague or whatever. You can understand why people would have an issue with that or like why that's hard to kind of buy into what are, what are you buying into in, in in some respects in that regard so yeah I would totally agree with what Ryan said. It's something I've been very conscious of in my, my tenure as planning minister coming in more or less sort of halfway through the process of developing NPF4 and, and conscious of that vision to 2045 and I've Goodness, that is the year I turned 60 years old. Um, and I, that still seems a very, very long way away from me. So it, it forces you one to think in these longer term time scales. And that can sometimes be a challenge because we so much of the attention um, is commanded by understandably what's in the here and now, and particularly as we've faced this series of crises over recent years, Brexit, then there's been the pandemic and now we're in a cost of living crisis. It can be quite difficult and challenging to, to lift our heads up and to look at the medium and longer term horizons, but it's so important to do so because so many of the challenges that we face can't be resolved in the here and now. And I'm also very conscious of the time it can take to go and develop new plans, NPF4, we can if we go through the, the, the genealogy of it, we can trace its origins almost to the review of planning, which was commissioned towards the end of 2015. And it's only in the last uh, couple of months that we've got to a position where we've been able to formally adopt it. And now the hard work really begins in implementing it. But one of the things that struck me about this process with NPF4 in government is just how cross-cutting, cross-portfolio and interdisciplinary it is. And I think that can perhaps add to the complexity of planning and the challenges around clear explanation and wider public understanding. But I'm keen just to get initially your impressions, Jane, of the importance of 
teamwork and interdisciplinary work within planning and how planning adds value to the wider objectives of planning authorities and indeed government overall. Well, it is very cross cutting. I think, I, I mean, this is not to uh, reduce the role of a planner in any way, but I, I consider us to be quite generalists in a sense that we um, are the kind of middlemen between, you know, the communities, uh, experts like ecologists, etc., um, and trying to bring that all together. In terms of like a project, it's multidisciplinary. Bringing together the MPF four was multidisciplinary. This is it's so it's a massive part of what we're doing. It is really why it's so complex. Um, and even as a planner, you're trying to get your head around some of these more technical reports, um, which can be quite mind blowing at times, especially first time you encounter certain reports. So yes, yeah, it is quite, and you rely upon these experts to provide you the right information, so you can put forward the right information. Um, for your planning applications, etc. Um, and again, the authorities are needing the expertise on their side to be able to actually assess this information that's coming in front of them. So, What are your reflections, Rhiannon, around how planning sits within a wider interdisciplinary team? Yeah, I think what Jane said is completely right. And as a planner, you have got a real job to communicate everyone's different kind of key points and bring something together that works for everyone. And it's that finding development that works in the right place for their, and that benefits the greater good, as I've said before. And I think it's that wider balance and the need to, there, there'll be pros and cons to every proposal and to every development because the, the way it is just now, no, nothing's going to meet every single tick box every single time and it's to make sure that we can get the best possible result and to do that you do need to work with other practitioners who have the experience in that field because we you can't be expected to be an expert in everything but you need to know enough and you need to be able to trust your advisors and that, that all comes with working as part of that multidisciplinary team and it's how you pull that information together to present a case or a proposal to benefit the wider population. It's interesting that point about um, having to be something of a, well having a specialist and also having to be something of a generalist um, and we touched earlier on about how we can encourage more young people into planning, but what for those who are a bit older, maybe working in a, a related area of an area not so related to planning, what do you think we need to be we can do to attract more people, perhaps who are looking for a change of career into planning as a profession? Jen? Um, I think, I, I, God, there's quite a lot of different uh, ways we could look at it, but I mean, I, I, I didn't have any previous career necessarily, I would say. Um, it was mostly sales and customer service based work that I was involved in across a range of different kind of sectors. Uh, and that's definitely been a good skill set for me. I think there's actually quite a lot of different people you could tap into for the planning, a, a career in planning to get a, if they were looking for a career change. I think like we were talking earlier, it's multidisciplinary um, and there's people out there with probably some quite random skill sets that would really be befitting of a planning professional. Um, so I think we've got to think quite broadly in that regard and maybe not go too deep into certain areas, but you know, geography, politics, sociology, these these kind of subjects, university wise, are probably areas you would you would want to hit um, and promote the, the profession there. You any thoughts, Rhiannon? Yeah, I think it's also worth noting the kind of ch change that's happened within the RTPI. So that's the Royal Town Planning Institute, which is the body that kind of governs, governs town planning. And that's where we would get our chartered membership. But one of the things they've done quite recently is there's a new route to membership now, which um, takes you through if you've got experience and you, you can then become an associate and become chartered through that. So the the wider profession is opening up and recognising that you don't necessarily need that chartered degree in town planning. Instead, you can learn on the job, you can develop those skills. And I think we can't underestimate the importance of transferable skills that people will have learned throughout their past careers. As Jane says, it doesn't have to be necessarily in something linked to planning. You, you learn great transferable skills in almost every role that you, you have. And it's just how you could put that into place in planning. So. I think that that's a really important sell and I think the other thing as well is to remember that planning is so wide-ranging so as much as you can maybe 
Jane and I have quite a similar experience and we both worked for local authorities and consultancy in kind of quite mainstream planning roles, but there's also environmental planning, there's heritage planning, regeneration, sustainability, wider climate change jobs. The list is really broad reaching and I think that that's a really important point to make that so many people probably already have experience in planning, but they maybe just haven't specialised in something yet either. And that's another option as well. Absolutely. It's really one of the things that's captivated to captain is me about planning is just breadth of it as well as the depth, but also it's its importance, as I was touching on earlier, for the future of Scotland and indeed for the future of the planet. I'm just keen to get your reflections, Jane, and, and what you think are the big challenges and the big opportunities for planning over the coming decade in Scotland. Well, I think there, there, there's definitely the big issues of the nature crisis, the climate crisis. There's still like a housing crisis going on. Um, and in all of in, in any sort of crisis, I think there's always an opportunity. I think where maybe if they, it's not obvious, a, a good think about it could certainly uh, allude to what the opportunities might be. Um, but I think we've, it, there is definitely an opportunity for planning to help deliver and the mitigation adaptation that's required for some of these things. Um, and in that there has to be like innovation and creativity. So yeah, I think there's a good few, a good lot of uh, opportunities out there to be grabbed. Yeah. Do you agree with that analysis, Rhiannon? Yeah, I would. And I think as planners, we are resourceful and resilient and we'll always try and solve these problems. But for me, one of the biggest concerns is wider resourcing of planning in Scotland. There's not enough planners in Scotland. We're hearing of jobs being advertised and people aren't applying for them because there's just not the staff to fill positions. And the concern is that this is just going to keep getting worse and then well, that will have an impact on performance and job satisfaction and not all snowball. So I think that that's my biggest concern is that we're not getting enough people in planning. And personally, I don't see why, because it's a great profession, a great career, and I've really enjoyed every time I've spent in it, to be honest, and every different job. So I think we need to keep singing that message to people that planning is is an option and that's a really good one and that we need to get more people into the profession. It's a really interesting point and I think it, it touches earlier and perhaps when we were considering some of perhaps the misconceptions around planning and how they perhaps predominate amongst you know, the, in, in the public consciousness. But clearly, you know, from this, this conversation has demonstrated the, the breadth of opportunities with um, planning is, is, is boundless and the opportunity to have influence and agency in some of the key decisions that we're going to have to take over the coming decade, a critical decade, as we all recognise for the future of the planet, um, demonstrates the, the importance of planning as a profession and as a career. I think going back to that, that earlier question around how can we inspire more young people into the profession, how important do you think it is to engage with people at the, the earliest stage? One of the things we've sought to do in the development of NPF4 and indeed in the new style of local development plans and through place efficiency assessments is have far more engagement with young people and children. How important do you think that is? not just to ensure that we have a planning system, we have development plans that reflect the aspirations of other communities, but also serves as an opportunity to inspire that next generation of planners. Jane? I think engagement is always key in, in making sure that you are, are visible as a, a profession in, in those, that engagement process. You know, once, when, then the children start coming on to like picking subjects at school or whatever, it may well be that influence. So yeah, early engagement, um, early visibility is, are definitely two key things because when you think about what your interest would be or maybe what you were going to do to university, it's usually I've usually found that other planners have had a, like family members who have been architects or planners or whatever and so obviously there is that visibility early in their life and um, that's something I didn't have and I wasn't aware of planning until I was like in my late 20s early 30s so yeah early early engagement is definitely crucial in that regard. And you agree Rhiannon do you think there's an opportunity through that greater engagement we have 
with children and young people feeding into the planning system around what they want to see in their communities and also an opportunity to inspire them to think about planning as a future career. Yeah, definitely. I mean, you, you hear the kind of obvious professions, doctor, lawyer, I don't know why planning's not up there with them. That's maybe put that wee bit too highly in terms of their wider recognition. But I mean, it should be. And even things like, I was really surprised myself the first time I watched Parts and Recreation because that's talked about a planning department and just wee things like that where you, and as we said before, Minecraft, Sims, it's all planning. So it is all there in the background. It's just bringing it out and strengthening the links. And I think that's particularly important to strengthen the links between planning and the curriculum for excellence. I think a lot of what we're taught in schools, especially subjects like geography, is essentially planning. And I don't really think that people often realise this. And I think it's that raising of awareness, which is particularly important with the younger generations. And, and we know how concerned the younger generations are with the place, specifically when we think about the impact of climate change and, and the role that our younger generations will have in trying to mitigate against these impacts. So I think that that's really important that it's taught wider particularly in schools and that, that careers advisors know about planning and that planning is probably a pretty obvious choice for anyone who goes to them and says I really like geography what can I do because I think too often that link's maybe missing as well so I think that would be my kind of main points to get young people in. Yeah Jane do you think we perhaps take planning for granted? I'm conscious that the modern planning system even in its precursors prior to 19, the 1947 Act, the earlier legislation that emerged um, between the wars. Ultimately, it grew of concerns around public health and sanitation and slum housing. And it was a response to that. And it was only through the regulation of the use of land that we were able to address some fundamental societal problems and fundamental problems that were um, impediments and inhibited economic growth and economic performance. But we've had the modern planning system now for some 75 years, as said the 75th anniversary of, of the Act being commenced and coming into force. So I, I just wonder, do you think we, we, we take planning perhaps for granted? And if you were to try to explain to someone what a world without planning might look like, what kind of picture would you paint for them? I think that's a really interesting question, actually. I think this also goes back to the point I mentioned earlier about <clears throat> the, the planning or the outcomes of planning is all around us. And I think when you're also surrounded quite a lot by things, you probably could take it very much for granted. Um, for me, I was quite curious as to why regeneration happened or why that change occurred. Um, and because I'd lived in a lot of different cities, these changes were a bit more evident to me or I didn't know the place. So I think that's a really interesting point about are people out there just not really seeing what th that this is an outcome of development and planning? Um, and perhaps there's something in there to start making a more tangible link. And we've mentioned this tangible link a few times already today. And I think this is really what is quite key is linking what you're seeing, what's happening back to the actual system and what is, how this is actually getting on the ground. And Rhiannon, what do you think a world without planning would look like? A bit chaotic and not very neat. <laughs> no, I think, um, I think part of the, the problem is that sometimes well, not sometimes, but there's always two sides to a story and for almost every proposal that's put forward, there will be objections to it and there'll be people that don't like it and people that are indifferent towards it. And if you don't like something, you're you're going to talk about it. But if you if you think, oh, yeah, that's probably all right, you're, you're not going to say anything and think, oh, well, that'll be fine, whatever happens. And I think part of the time that's the problem with the bad press and people like, oh, no, they're putting this bike lane in and doing this, this and that, whereas actually most of the the cyclists are pretty happy about it, but they've just not really written anything in and said. So um, I think that's part of the problem and that people don't really appreciate the, the tiny little tweaks that planners are making to almost every proposal that goes in. If, you, um, if you're the case officer, there's always minor things that you're trying to just change to get things to make sure they accord with policy. So is that putting some extra windows in to create privacy on a lane or is it reducing the height so it doesn't impact a building nearby? And, it's just small changes like that that make the real difference. And I think that can be really difficult to shout about as a practitioner and a professional to say, 
oh, well, I did a really good job here because without me, that would be a dark lane. And because no one really thinks about it. And it's those kind of small points that that you say, if it wasn't for planning, what would we have? We'd be creating there's a real high chance that you could be creating unsafe places, that things could be going unregulated, that we wouldn't be building development that benefits the health and well-being of people. Um, I mean, as you say, think back to what it was like before we had planning. So I suppose that's the only real comparison you can make because it's really difficult to measure that that impact mm -hmm. when it's often so minor. But um, I do think we need to highlight the positives of planning in our day to day lives and talk a bit more about what a great career we can have in planning. And I think it all takes a bit more of a culture change within the profession mm -hmm. so that we can all look to do more and just to to shout out about what we've done. And actually, one of the things um, that I think has been really important, Minister, is the work that you've done so far to raise the profile planning and I commend your involvement in projects so far to date. So things like the Future Planners Project, which you've been really quick to speak up about as well. It really helps to have that support on sides and it's initiatives like this that will be key to ensure that we get more planners into the profession. Well, that, that's very kind of you to say and I'm hugely grateful to all of our partners who have supported the work in developing the Future Planners Project and very much looking to work to, to look forward to that continued partnership working to take it forward. I'm conscious that you are of course young planners but you do have a bit of experience now and I'm just conscious I'm, just, I'm interested rather that if you could go back and speak to yourself on your first day as a planner knowing what you know now is there any advice that you would give to yourself is there any ideas that you had about what a career in planning would entail which have been realized or perhaps did you have any misconceptions yourself when you started as a planner that you've been disabused of jane i don't really know that's quite an interesting question um i think i think because i had a lot of work experience prior to like there were certain elements of coming into like the place of employment um that's probably gives me a, a different, slightly different outlook uh, in terms of maybe somebody coming into it as their first job or even after like a placement. Um, but yeah, no, I think I think I've done the right thing in terms of gaining experience, but like quite broadly, because I started with the Scottish Government as a graduate planner. That was a temporary contract. It was always understood that it would end. Um, and after that, I picked up development management experience in like local women's and Trossets National Park and Western Bankshire Council. Um, I then went out and did a bit of regional planning with the Clyde Plan two years over basically what was the COVID years and now I'm working as a planning consultant <clears throat> and I think sitting where I'm sitting now I've, I've definitely made from that day one to now I've made the right move um, and now I'm really needing to take a deep dive into planning and really get into the guts of it because it has been quite a broad experience thus far so and what about you, Rianne? If you could travel back to your, your your first day in planning, what advice would you give yourself? Or would you just say, enjoy the journey? Yeah, to be honest, I think, so I was only 21 when I first started my first planning job. So I um, was very young, fresh out of uni. But I think the one thing that I would say is to any young professional, really, is to just have a bit of confidence in yourself and ask questions and put forward your thoughts and opinions. There'll be a time and a place for it, but don't ever let something go unspoken because particularly for a lot of these new subjects, it's, it's all new science and you're the one that's just done four years at university on it and you might be more clued up than someone who's not really done a, a course on it in recent years. So there's always time to, to explore new avenues, to open up the thought process and to have that wider discussion to try and find the right solution to whatever the problem might be. So I think it's just have that confidence in yourself and your abilities and and really just push your good, great ideas. I think that's a, an inspiring note in which to bring things to a close on. But before doing a final question to both of you, um, what are your hopes for planning over the next decade, Jane? Um, well, it'd be good if we could start solving some of these big crises or making a dent in it at least. Um, I think we've got a long way to go as a profession and trying to encourage more young people in. Um, there's a, there's a, a few different matters within and sort of out with planning, I guess, that needs to um, have put some work in. So hopefully in 10 years time, it'd be nice to see a new cohort of planners 
all trained up, all becoming chartered, all working towards um, actually implementing like MPF four and and trying to make that dent in in that climate crisis, nature crisis scenario. Yeah. Rhiannon. That's a really tricky question. If you think back 10 years ago and think what would you expect in the next 10 years? I suppose when I first started, I wasn't expecting a whole new process, new legislation, a complete change in process. And I think that that's a good thing that people are looking back and reflecting and recognising where things don't work and continually looking to improve the profession, which I think is one of the things I enjoy most about planning is that it's really forward thinking. It's always looking for solutions. And I would just like to see that to continue and to have a group of professionals that are happy to shout about the great work that they do and I just like to see that wider culture change that I think is needed. Absolutely I think that that need for a culture change to move from conflict to collaboration is, is so so Definitely. important but I think we're in very safe hands with both of you and both of you and many of the other young planners and can I just um, say in, in closing this it's been an absolute pleasure to talk to you both and uh, on behalf of the Scottish Government, thank you to you both for all that you do as ambassadors uh, for planning in Scotland and for the work that you will be doing just by your example and influence of encouraging so many more people into the profession, a profession which I would also encourage any young person and any not so young person as well looking for a changing career to explore and to embrace because it can be a real force for good. Thank you. Thanks for your time today. It's really appreciated. Yeah, thanks, Minister. Thank you.